At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. <clears throat> May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. <clears throat> the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. But he kept going. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained in Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come, here it is, do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Putin's and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And you say, Pastor Cora, what in the world has that got to do with New Year? <clears throat> it sounds like we're, we're, we're reading somebody else's mail. That's exactly what it is. It's a letter sent from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. And at the end of this letter, we're reading the final, this is why it's important, we're reading the final recorded words of the Apostle Paul. Listen, the Apostle Paul is the one that wrote much of the New Testament. More, almost two-thirds of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul penned. But these are the very last words that we know of that he wrote before he died. <clears throat> what happened next has been a debate for more than 2,000 years. But it seems most likely that very soon after he wrote these words, he was beheaded by the Emperor Nero. Okay? <clears throat> So, why were these words so important? Well, I would tell you that, that what somebody speaks, when they know their death is imminent, are very important words. If you know you're about to die, you're probably not going to be discussing football records. You're probably not going to be going over what you read on Facebook two days ago. If you know you're about to die, you want to say some things that people need to hear because you know this is the last opportunity you're going to get to speak. And these are the last recorded words of the Apostle Paul. And, and you notice mostly these words are written about people. <clears throat> In his final days, his, his thoughts went to Demas, a friend, who had left him at his time of need. And it said he was choosing to, to, to love the world instead. But then he thought of other good friends, Crescent, who had gone to Galatia as a missionary, and Titus, who was serving in Dalmatia, and Tychicus, who had gone to Ephesus. He's, he's also grateful that Luke has remained in Rome to give him comfort while he is awaiting his execution. He warns Timothy about a man named Alexander, the metal worker, who opposed him and did all that he could to stop the preaching of the gospel. And he sends special greetings to friends in distant places. <clears throat> he sends greetings to Timothy from friends in Rome. And then he gives God thanks for standing by him in his trial when it seemed that all the other people had forsaken him. He even said, the Lord delivered me from the mouth of the lion and will continue to deliver me so that he has complete confidence that he will one day enter the heavenly kingdom. But more than anything else, I believe, he wanted Timothy to come see him in prison before he died. Remember, Timothy was probably in Ephesus, hundreds of miles away. And the main mode of transportation in that day was LPCs. You know what LPCs are, right? Leather personnel carriers. Sandals. That's, that's the way they got around. 
And so it would take several months for Timothy to come to Rome. But this old apostle wanted to see his young friend one final time before he died. Listen to what he says and how he repeats himself. In verse 9 he says, Do your best to come to me soon. In verse 11 he says, Get Mark and bring him with you. And in verse 12 he says, When you come, bring my coat that I left with Carpus at Troas and also the books and above all the parchments. And then verse 21, he says, do your best to come before winter. Timothy, if you're going to come at all, come now. Don't wait. Don't delay. I won't be alive much longer. Come quickly, my friend. Come before winter. <clears throat> I mentioned to you that, that this title of this sermon is not original to me. A man by the name of Clarence McCartney, a young man, when he was first called to be the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and in 1915, he preached a sermon that he entitled, Come Before Winter, based on verse 21 that, of the passage that we read. The congregation was so moved that they asked him to preach it again, and so he did every year for 37 straight years. It became one of the most famous sermons of the 20th century. In preparing for this message, I borrowed some of his thoughts and kind of put them and shaped them into my own words. But this text raises three questions for us to consider. The first one, why come before winter? <clears throat> well, the answer to that is, is both practical and simple. During the winter, the weather made travel by sea almost impossible. If Timothy delayed it all, he would not be able to come to Rome until the spring. And if he waited that long, Paul would very likely be dead. Some things in life must be done before winter, or they will not be done at all. I'm convinced that there are doors of opportunity that are open before us today. Listen to me. But if we fail to walk through them, by springtime, they will be forever shut. You can't wait forever to respond to things that are important. Things that seem small today become large tomorrow. Shakespeare said this, There is a tide in the affairs of men which, when taken at flood, in other words, at a flood, when it's coming at you at a flood, leads to fortune. Sometimes we must respond now. We must answer now. We must act now. We must not wait or delay. We must not put things off. We shouldn't say, we should not say like Scarlet, and gone with the wind. Tomorrow is another day. That was her famous line. If things were going her way, she just said, tomorrow is another day. In other words, <coughs> put it off until tomorrow. In the weeks that followed the great tragedy we refer to as 9-11, the transcripts of messages that were sent to and from the Port Authority of New York on September the 11th were released. And these transcripts included phone calls between people who were told to stay in the World Trade Center and never, ever got out of line. One of the most heart-rending calls came from the assistant manager of Windows on the World, of, on the World Restaurant. 
sits on the, that sat on the top of the, the tower. Four times she called asking for help. In the final call, she reported that the stairwells were filled with smoke and the elevators were not working. The officer she spoke to on the phone said, we're trying to get up to you, dear. But they never made it. Because a few minutes after that call, the towers fell. It collapsed in a smoky heap of rust. Probably you saw that yourself, at least not when it was live. In James 4, 13 and 14, we read, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. <clears throat> you see, that's all that we are. We're a vapor, a mist. We're dust in the wind. Like the grass in the field, it's here today and tomorrow is mowed down. So Paul says to Timothy, make sure you come quickly. Bring my coat because it's cold here in prison in the winter. Bring my books and my parchments so I can write while I'm here. Listen, I think you all agree, would all agree with me that we all need friends. Sometimes we feel like that we cannot make it without the help of our friends. I honestly don't believe that Paul was afraid to die. I don't think that had anything to do with this. Paul is the one that wrote, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's already said, these, he's already penned these words, I've fought the good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept my faith. So he knows exactly what is going on. Death was not Paul's problem. But you see, as strong in his faith as Paul was, he was also human. He didn't want to die alone. That's one of those fears we hardly ever talk about. But you know it's right around the corner. We don't want to die alone. We don't want to be forgotten. We want somebody to be with us. And we want somebody to remember that we were here. So the second question was, did Timothy go? <clears throat> the truth is, is we don't know the answer to that question. In his sermon, McCartney imagines that Timothy said to himself, yes, I must go to Rome, but first I need to attend to some matters in Ephesus. And because he delays, winter comes and he cannot get a ship until spring. For months he worries about Paul. He worries about his friend who's there in prison hundreds of miles away. At last, the weather clears and he's able to make the journey to Rome. And when he gets there, he tries to find Paul. But no one seems to know where he is. <clears throat> Finally, he comes to the home of Claudius or Prudence or Linus, and they recognize him. Aren't you Timothy? Paul wanted so badly to see you. He prayed that you would come. He never gave up hope of seeing you again. But he was beheaded last October. His last message to you was, Give Timothy my love. Tell him goodbye for me. Tell him to meet me in heaven. Now, we don't know if any of that happened. But this much is certain. Procrastinate, you can write this down. Procrastination destroys many good intentions. Procrastination destroys many good intentions. More marriages die not because of deliberate desertion, but because of slow neglect. We mean to say a word of encouragement, but we never get around to it. We mean to write a letter or make a call, but it never gets done. We mean to share Christ with our next door neighbor, 
We intend to get serious about our faith in Christ. We, we want to pray more. We want to read the Bible. We have great dreams and high ideals. But time and neglect and busyness all distract us until we wake up one day and it's too late. Our marriage relationship has grown cold. The children that we wanted to influence have grown up and left home. And our spiritual life has faded. Come before winter. Come now. Do it now. Serve God now. What, what you would do for God, you can do, but you must not delay. There's a story told of three apprentice devils who were coming to earth for the first time for their first assignment. And they met with Satan, who asked them what strategy they planned to follow. <clears throat> the first one said, I will tell people that there is no God. Satan says, that's not going to work, because in their heart of hearts, when push comes to shove, they know there is a God. You see, Satan knows that when the car at the intersection is coming at you and it's about to hit you, you don't cry out, oh, who do you cry out to? Oh, God. Not oh, Buddha. <laughs> oh, Muhammad. The second one said, I'll tell them there's no hell. Satan said, that won't work either because there's so much evil on earth, they know there must be a hell. The third apprentice thought, thought for a minute, and then he said, I'll just tell them that there's no hurry. Satan said, tell them that, and you will ruin them by the millions. Number three, would you sure you're thinking to yourself, yeah, sure I would. Of course we would have gone. The problem is, is that often we have good intentions, but somehow we never get around to doing what we intended to do. We mean well, we really do. We meant for things to be different. But all too often we end up with regret. If I had owned it. But, you see, some things need to be said, and some things need to be done now. The opportunity is before us today. Those opportunities may be gone tomorrow. So what is it that God is calling you to do? What good deed does God want you to perform? What act of forgiveness does God want you to offer? What step of faith, what prayer should you pray? What sin do you need to confess? What bad habit needs to be broken? What could you do for the Lord and for His church? What class could you teach? What call could you make? What relationship needs to be repaired? Who in your life needs to know Jesus, but you've been putting it off? Whatever it is, I challenge you, come before winter. Do it. Do it. Do it now. If you intend to spend time with your children, do it now, because they won't be at home forever. The fourth point to this sermon is that Christ stands at the door. I've looked in the Bible and I consider myself to be a scholar of the Bible. I don't know everything about the Bible. 
I have more that I don't know that I do know. But I have looked in the Bible, and I cannot find one place in the Bible where it says, come to Christ tomorrow. <laughs> but if you can find one, let me know, and I'll come down from here, and I will no longer preach. You see, the Bible always says, not tomorrow. Come to Christ while you have the opportunity, while you have the desire. You see, in the end, it's Christ who calls us. He speaks to us today. He's standing at the door of your heart, knocking. Will you open the door and let him in? Come unto me, he says. Come now. Don't delay. Don't put it off. The Bible says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. The sweet, I believe the sweetest word and the most solemn word of salvation is the little word today. Remember, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, when he was up in the tree, he said, Come down out of that sycamore tree. I'm going to your house today. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may never come. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. Will you open and let him in? Many years ago, a man by the name of Holman Hunt painted a classic picture. It's there before you. Put that back up, brother. The title of the picture is called Christ Standing at the, at, the, at the Door. It depicts Jesus at the door of a small English cottage. Everything about the picture seems normal, but there's one thing that's missing. You know what it is? There's no handle on the door. There's no doorknob. The only way that Jesus can come in is if you open the door and let him in. See, the door has to be open from the inside. The painting is true to life and it's true to the Bible. If you hear the Lord knocking at your heart's door, do not delay. Go now and open the door and invite Jesus Christ into your life as Savior and Lord. Don't wait a second longer. If God has called you to do something and you know that call is very clear, then don't wait. Do it now. Come before winter. What is God telling you to do? Whatever it is, come before winter. With one love.